Hello, everybody. It's time for the reading. So we're reading today from Luke chapter 9, um, verses 18 to 27. The page number is on the screen there. Okay, Luke chapter 9, and we'll begin reading at verse 18. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit or lose his very self? And if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Well, good morning. It's great to to be with you as we open up uh, this new part of Luke's Gospel together. Well, in the summer of 1884, C.T. Studd was on top of the world. He'd had the best start to life his parents could possibly have given him. He'd studied and graduated from Eton and from Trinity College, Cambridge. He came from a wealthy family. He had all the connections you could ask for. And to top it all off, he'd just come back from uh, from playing a key part in England's victorious trip to Australia to reclaim the ashes. He was a household name, he was a celebrity, he was known across the nation. He was honoured and adored. He had the world at his feet and he could do anything he wanted. And yet, when his brother George became seriously ill, he was left questioning what all of that fame and that flattery was worth. He said, I know that cricket would not last and honour would not last, and nothing in this world would last, but it was worthwhile living for the world to come. And so he turned his back on England. He headed off to China to help Hudson Taylor uh, to preach the gospel to the people in China as part of the inland mission. When his father died, and he inherited what today would have been more than three million pounds, he gave it all away to Christian charities. And he continued to give his life to proclaiming the gospel in China and America and India and Africa. In 1956, Elizabeth learned that her husband of just three years had been speared to death just five days after they had landed on a remote beach in Ecuador and approached a Native American tribe. 
Just two years later, Elizabeth took her then three-year-old daughter back to the same tribe that had killed her husband. She lived with them for five years. She taught them the great news about King Jesus and in God's mercy saw many of them come to put their trust in him. Paul. Paul graduated a few years ago and he got a job in a prestigious London city bank. Right from the start of his career, he was earning six figures. But Paul had made a decision. Paul had decided that he was going to try and keep living on the same costs as when he was a student. So that he'd have more money to be able to give away. More money to be able to put to use. Giving away almost all of his wages to help support his church and to support other charities and mission organizations. He had to ignore the people around him telling him how foolish he was telling him that he needed other priorities. And then there's John. John was a teacher in an ordinary town in the north of England. He had a wife and kids, and money was tight, but they got by. But John's church was doing a building project, and so John and his wife decided to remortgage their house in order to be able to give £15,000 to the project. It set them back years and years in their goals of paying off the mortgage. And I could give you countless other stories down the years of people who have done seemingly crazily sacrificial things in the name of Jesus. But why? Why do people do that? Why do people do this? Why would anyone turn their backs on the comfort and the safety that this world has to offer? What drives a person to turn away from the success and glory and to plow themselves into the hard slog of working for Jesus. Well, if you keep listening this morning, then I hope we'll see together the reason. We'll get this vision that drove those, those people to do those crazy things in the name of Christ. If you've closed your Bible, please do reopen it as we work through it together because, because over the next few weeks, we're going to be diving into this middle section of Luke's Gospel. We're going to be coming face to face with who Jesus truly is. And we're going to see what following him is going to look like as we see him lay out the call to follow the cross. But before I give too much of that away, let's turn to our passage today and our first point together, recognizing the Christ. Recognizing the Christ. Because have a look down at verse 18 with me. Luke sets the scene. He says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? Well, Luke, the writer of this gospel, has taken great care in his account of Jesus' life. Luke, Luke doesn't waste his words. And he uses a load of different devices to draw our attention to key parts of his book. And he sets the scene for us today, doesn't he? Telling us Jesus is praying in private with his disciples. Now, I'm sure we can imagine that's probably something that Jesus did a whole lot of the time. But Luke only tells us about Jesus praying at key points in his story. When we see Jesus praying, Luke's saying, pay close attention to what happens next. And so what does Jesus do? He launches us into it with a question to the disciples. Who do the crowds say I am? The crowds, they're, they're Luke's collective term for all of those different people that have been present in Jesus' ministry so far. Luke mentions them 38 different times through the gospel. And their reaction to Jesus tells us how things are going, tells us how they're finding, how Jesus' mission is landing with them. Whenever Jesus gathers to teach, the crowds are there. When he heals, when he drives out demons, the crowds are watching. These crowds are made up of all sorts of different people. They're very young, they're very old, they're men, they're women, they're tax collectors, they're prostitutes, they're religious leaders. And they have all heard his teaching about the coming kingdom of God. They have seen his power and authority. They've heard his call to repent, and they have seen 
Jesus in action, performing miracles. And in the section just before this, they've seen him turn a small packed lunch, five fish, two loaves of bread, into a feast for over 5,000 with baskets and baskets and baskets left over. Jesus has been patiently teaching and showing the crowds who he is. But have they got it? Have they understood? We'll have a look at verse 19, see how the disciples answer. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Have the crowds got the message? Is there Jesus clarity among them? Well, apparently not. It seems there's a whole load of confusion. Now, the crowds have got some bits right, haven't they? The crowds have recognized that there is something very, very special about Jesus. They've recognized he's no ordinary man, recognized he must come from God. They know he's definitely special. But they've come up with three suggestions that are, that are all unlikely, aren't they? Some have got him confused with John the Baptist, who had been beheaded by King Herod not too long before this. Some of them think that he's a titan of the Old Testament, maybe Elijah, who was the biggest, the, the best known Old Testament prophet. Some think he's another of God's prophets from all those years ago, who's come back to life. Well, all of them are, are improbable, aren't they? You're either the guy who's just had his head chopped off, the guy who's been dead a few hundred years, or a guy who rode off to heaven in a chariot of fire. Simply put, they recognized Jesus was special. They recognized he was powerful. They recognized he was from God. But they don't actually recognize who he really is. And so Jesus turns the question on the disciples, those people who have walked and talked and slept and eaten with Jesus throughout his ministry so far. And look at verse 20. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus, he puts them on the spot, doesn't he? Have they got it? Have they seen it? Have they worked it out? And Peter nails it. He has followed Jesus everywhere. He's heard him teach. He's seen the miracles. He's seen the power, the authority, the wisdom. And he has come to realize that Jesus can be no one else, no one other than the Christ of God, the Messiah, God's promised king, the promised son of David. God's king who's come to establish God's rule over God's kingdom. The one who all of God's promises point to. And as readers of Luke's gospel so far, we're meant to see fireworks go off here. Pyrotechnics proclaiming the victory. We're going to get a glimpse of that later today in Berlin as, as the European champions are crowned. As the fireworks, as the explosions go off, proclaiming the victory. That's the scale of how massive this is. They've got it. They have understood who Jesus is. And so now Jesus can move on. He can move on to show them the work of proclaiming his kingship, what it's going to look like to follow him. Because if Jesus is God's Christ, his promised king, come to bring about and establish God's kingdom, then it changes everything. So they know who Jesus is. He needs to show them the path he's going to take. That's our second point this morning, the path of the Christ. Because the disciples are in for a proper shock. I'm pretty confident that they were not expecting Jesus' answer here. Have a look at, at verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Can you imagine the disciples? They're buzzing with excitement. They've recognized Jesus. They're getting ready to follow their king to Jerusalem. And he's just thrown an ice cold bucket of water over their heads. Told them to sit down, to keep quiet. What on earth is he doing? 
Well, to understand that, I think we have to appreciate what the disciples, what Israel were expecting from the Christ. Now, the Old Testament is littered with promises of what God's anointed king will come and will do. But none of them are clearer than Psalm 2. I've put it on the screen for us to follow through. Now, for context, this is a psalm written by King David about a thousand years before Jesus. And he says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Well, David sets the scene for us as the psalm opens with the nations, all those people all over the world who do not want to live with God as their king. And these nations, these kings, they come together. They plot, they scheme. They bring all of their armies together. And you see their target? They want to overthrow the Lord and his anointed one, his Christ. They want to defeat them, to break off their chains and be free. Well, how is God going to react to this threat to his rule? Is he worried about it? Have a look how it continues. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Well, God sees their rebellion and he laughs. There is simply no way that these rebels can win. And their situation gets worse. He terrifies them. Do you see how he does that? By declaring that he has installed his king on Zion, in Jerusalem. Those, these nations and kings thought they were going to fight against God, but God is going to fight against them through his Christ. See how it continues. I'll proclaim, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. God's Christ, his anointed one, is going to be none other than God's own son. And God is going to give him the nations, those ruled by those rebel kings, as his as his inheritance. More than that, the whole earth, everything on the earth, is going to be given to God's anointed king. There is no place where his rule will not be felt. And those that rise up against him will be shattered like pottery, thrown on the floor. They'll be ruled with a rod of iron, dashed, broken, destroyed. And so look how the psalm ends. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss his son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So a call goes out to the kings of the earth to abandon their fight against God and against the Christ and instead come and seek peace, come and take refuge in him. A call to be wise, a call to reflect on the foolishness of going against God and make peace. A call to come over to the winning side, to shelter behind God's Christ rather than to be destroyed by him. This is who Israel thought the Christ was, God's all-powerful, all-conquering king who was going to come in and overthrow their enemies, to throw out the Romans and establish God's kingship over the whole world. 
Following him, they thought, was going to be a glorious victory parade where they will join in in his triumph. And for the last 700 years, Israel has been under consistent oppression. They've been ruled over by the Babylonians, by the Persians, by the Macedonians, by the Seleucids, and now the Romans. Now, it's easy to forget in our Western comfort what living under the oppression of foreign rulers for centuries and centuries would have been like. Knowing that they, that Israel, were meant to be God's treasured possession, the means through which God was going to declare his glory to the whole world. So in that context, it's easy to see how passages like Psalm 2 or Psalm 110, where God tells his anointed king to sit at his right hand while he defeats all of his enemies and uses the nations as his footstool. You can see the attraction, can't you? The desire for this Christ, this Messiah, to come and overthrow their oppressors. That's the cultural weight that Israel would have been waiting for. And so you can imagine the disciples' shock, can't you? When Jesus says, shh, don't tell anyone. Keep my identity to yourselves. And if that shock was a statement, if that statement was a shock, then his next one would have knocked them to the floor because Jesus' path to victory was going to take a very different path. Have a look back in Luke at verse 22. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, this is a million miles away from the disciples' expectations of the Christ, isn't it? Jesus starts by confirming his credentials. He calls himself the Son of Man. That's a reference to a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel sees someone coming to God, and they're given all of the authority and all of the power and all of the worship of every nation. People of every tribe and tongue and language will worship him. And this son of man is going to rule a kingdom that will last forever and can never be destroyed. Jesus really is the Christ. But the path of the Christ is to suffer now and to receive glory later. Because Jesus must suffer these many things. Did you see that must? He must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teacher of the law. Jesus must be killed and then three days later rise to life again. Jesus is the all-conquering king, but he's only going to become that king through rejection and suffering and death and resurrection. And that is a massive change to the expectations of the disciples. He's ripped the rug from under their feet. They thought they were going to ride to Jerusalem to overthrow the Romans and to proclaim Jesus as king. But he's going there to die. But it's not time for that yet. Jesus isn't quite ready for everyone to know who he is. The disciples know that Jesus is God's anointed Messiah, his Christ. They know the path that he's on, but they need to know what it's going to look like for them and for all those others who will follow the Christ. It's our third point, following the Christ. Because no sooner has Jesus floored the disciples with his own path, he lays out what it's going to look like to be his disciple, the call to be one of his followers, what it will mean for them to submit to him as their king, because it's a decision that each of them will have to make. Because remember Psalm 2, the choice God set before the world, the choice is to follow God's king and to worship him or to be destroyed by him. There is no third choice. There is no middle way. And Jesus' call to follow him is to set him as the supreme Lord of their lives. 
It's a claim greater than any human could ever make. It's a life-changing decision, deciding to follow Jesus. And so Jesus shows them what it will look like. And it's a path of suffering now for great glory later. And he does that by showing them four pictures, four challenges, four contrasts, to help them to, and us to see what the path of following the crucified Christ will be. Have a look at verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The first picture is carrying their cross, denying themselves. It's a call to say no to my desires, my wants, my dreams, and placing them underneath Jesus. That's not to say that their plans and dreams can't or won't be achieved, but Jesus is giving them a bigger calling, a new shape to their lives that will spread through every aspect of life, every fiber of their being. There is not a single cell in their body or stone on the path ahead of them that falls outside of Jesus' kingship. And so the path of discipleship is going to be one of daily choosing to put Jesus first. To pick up our cross is to put our needs behind God's goals and to do it when that path leads to suffering, when that path leads to pain, when that path leads to hardship, when to trust Jesus means saying no to the easy options, to the quiet life, and instead leads us into a lion's den, into a fire, into persecution. A call to endure any and every suffering that comes our way. And the challenge to do it daily is a reminder of the challenge it's going to be. That this path is going to be a continuous battle. Isn't it? Every day when disciples of Jesus wake up, they will have to choose to put Jesus first. Everywhere they go, everything they do, everyone they meet, every relationship they have needs to be put under the rule of the Christ. And it's something that we all find so hard to do. I'm constantly reminded of this challenge as we try and raise our two boys, Jacob and Ben. Every single day is filled with time and time again of them telling us what they want and what they need and us having to tell them, that actually they need to eat their food and not throw it, that they need to listen to the Bible instead of jumping on the bed, that they need to hold our hands as we cross the road instead of just charging out across the traffic to get to the park. It's a constant challenge. It's never easy. They hate being told that their dreams, their wants, their desires have to wait, that they have to fit into our plans. Now, we may be slightly older than them. Some of us may be slightly wiser than them. But denying ourselves daily is going to be a continual challenge. The second picture makes it even more stark, doesn't it? Have a look at verse 24. Jesus says, Forever, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. If the disciples were unclear about the path Jesus was, was calling them to, he makes it crystal clear here, doesn't he? Come and lose your life. Life with Jesus as king, the life of picking up the cross daily and following the path to the cross is a call that the world around us the world ruled by the kings in rebellion to God, hate. Our world calls us to put ourselves first, doesn't it? To, to look after number one, to make sure that no one puts us down, to ensure that we achieve our goals, self-actualization, no matter the consequences, no matter who gets stepped on. Our world says, put your life first. But Jesus says, no. Give up your life. Lose your life for me. Jesus says, following me is going to cost you 
your life here and now. Not putting ourselves first, not putting our dreams and our goals first is going to cost us. Following Jesus is going to mean different decisions. Decisions about how we spend our money, about how we take our holidays, about how we work, about where we work, about how we rest. It's going to change every single aspect of our life. And for some followers of Christ, like Jim Elliot, who I mentioned at the start, following Christ is literally going to cause us to lose our life for Jesus. The followers of Jesus, compared to the world around us, it's going to often look like our decisions make us poorer. It's going to mean missing out on some of the joys that this world has to offer, which flows into the third picture Jesus shows us. Following Jesus means losing the world means the disciples giving up their dreams of making their mark on the world. It flows straight out of the first two, doesn't it? If the disciples were harboring any hope that following God's anointed king was going to see them ruling in, under him in Jerusalem, they were sorely disappointed. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world? and yet lose or forfeit his soul. Following Jesus is going to mean saying no to this world. It's knowing that to gain the world now results in the loss of our soul. When you hear Jesus put it like that, it seems obvious, doesn't it? 300 years before Jesus, Alexander the Great came to the throne of a little kingdom of Macedon, just north of Greece. By the age of 33, just 14 years later, he had conquered most of the known world from Greece all the way through to the borders of India. A Roman poet writing a few hundred years after him wrote this about Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great was alive, the world was not big enough to contain his ambition. But while Alexander chafed at the confines of this world in life, in death, a coffin was enough. In death, a coffin was enough. Because we're embodied souls, aren't we? We live in a physical world here and now. We know what it is. Our world screams at us to make our mark on the world, to follow Alexander the Great, to carve out our kingdom, our path. And it can be so hard to let that go. To turn our backs on living for the pleasure that this world offers and instead turn and follow Jesus on the path of hardship and suffering, carrying our crosses. It's hard. Jesus knows that this is going to be tough for his disciples. And he needs them to know what's in store. And finally, Jesus shows than what it will look like for their reputation in the world. Have a look at, at verse 26. Jesus says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Life following Jesus as their king will mean a life of never being ashamed of Jesus, never shying away from when he says something that they don't like. It's a life taking pride in Jesus in any and every situation. Now, that's easy when Jesus is popular, when his teaching, when his calling is in line with our world's ways. But for the disciples, think about what Jesus has just told them. Jesus has just told them that he is going to lead a life that is going to run, cause a run-in with the authorities. It's going to cause him to be taken prisoner, to be put in jail, to be put in front of a judge, to be sentenced to death and to die on a cross. Following Jesus will mean followers going on that same path, a path in our world today where Jesus' words are not considered acceptable, are they, by large portions of the world around us. An increasing portion of the voices around us, our schools, our workplaces, our societies, our homes, 
The temptation is to be quiet. The temptation is to shy away when Jesus is ridiculed, when his teachings are rubbished, when sin is praised and righteousness is mocked, when topics of sexuality or pride or money or morality or abortion raise their heads. The temptation is to keep quiet. But Jesus' followers must not be ashamed of their king or his words. Jesus' followers need to know that doing that will cost us friends, won't it? Might cost us jobs. Might cost us the chance to get married or to have children. Knowing that to stand up for Jesus may well land us in jail with the criminals, with the lowest ranks of our society. Following Jesus as the Christ means putting his reputation above our own. This truly is a call to suffer now, isn't it? To put our desires, our hopes for the world, our reputation, our good standing, our very lives under God's anointed king. Why would anyone take up Jesus' offer when it's put like that? Why would anyone choose to come after him to follow in his footsteps? Well, because to follow Jesus now does mean suffering now. But it does mean eternal glory to come. So far, we've just focused on the hardships that Jesus warns about, which is necessary, isn't it? We need to be able to count the cost. We need to know how hard this call really is to follow Jesus. Otherwise, when temptations arise, when the going gets tough, then we can be tempted to fall away. But with Jesus as their king, the disciples are going to be getting far, far more than they ever give up. Have a look back through those verses with me. See the glory that Jesus offers. Following God's anointed king means that we get to actually be who we were made to be. It means we can live and walk in step with God, having peace with God. Knowing that we're walking in step with the one who made the world, who made us. To live under the rule of the Christ, the life following Jesus, even though it will be full of hardships, is the best possible life that anyone could live now. Living life as God intended it, growing to better know and love and see their king step by step, day by day. Following God's anointed king will mean that they will lose their lives now in this world. But they will see the reward of living in eternal glory with God forever. In light of eternity, this life will just fade away. Following God's anointed king and losing the world now will mean that their souls will be saved. That they will gain an eternal kingdom unmarred by sin. Unmarred, unbroken by the suffering and pain of this world. A world where they can rejoice in the glory of God's Son and his anointed King. Following God's anointed King and not being ashamed of him means that they will be honoured. That God will be pleased with them. That the Christ, the eternal King of the universe, will be delighted by their faithful service. They will receive glory and honour and reputation and family and friendships and eternal joy. Yes, the life of following Jesus to the cross will be costly here and now. But in perspective, Jesus' call is to follow him through those hardships for that future glory. And that future, that kingdom is near. Did you see that in verse 27? Have a look with me. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. The kingdom Jesus is preaching and proclaiming and calling people to is near. So near that Jesus can say with confidence that some who are around him that he is speaking to will see it in their lifetimes. In a short matter of weeks or months, they're going to see it for themselves. 
They're going to see the king come into his kingdom. They're going to see all the promises of the Old Testament come to fruition. They're going to see the kingdom of God come about that the whole world has been waiting for. They're going to be there in Jerusalem a few months later as Jesus is taken by the priests, as he is tried, as he is flogged, as he is mocked, as he is put to death on a cross, condemned to a criminal's death. They're going to be there three days later when he rises from the grave. They're going to be there with him for 40 days as he teaches them about life in the kingdom, about what life will look like following him as they live for God in the light of the cross. What life will look like daily taking up their cross and following God's anointed king. They'll be there as they watch him ascend to heaven to take his seat at God's side. The Christ will come into his kingdom and he does as he dies on the cross. He will come into his glory as he hangs on that tree. Many of these disciples, they do see this. They do see the kingdom come in power and they go out and they proclaim Jesus' kingdom and they suffer and die horribly. The disciples are killed in horrible deaths around the world, taking the news of Jesus. And they gladly follow Jesus' footsteps, knowing where that path led, proclaiming his kingship with great joy. Why did they do that? Why did they decide to follow God's Christ? Well, because they recognized who Jesus was. They heard his call to follow him. They understood what it would mean to daily pick up their crosses, to turn their backs on the pursuit of worldly glory and reputation and recognition, and to joyfully serve their king with all of their hearts. And hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of people have heard that call to follow Jesus since and joyfully given their lives to serve him. Well, let's conclude. This morning, this morning we've seen Jesus sketch out the life that he calls each and every person in this world to lead. There's so much there to unpack, isn't it? It takes a lifetime for us to get our heads around it all. But let me ask you just two quick questions. Firstly, have you recognized the Christ? I'm aware, looking around, that there are folk here who it's your first time at church this morning. Folk who are new to church, new to the Bible. Have you recognized that Jesus is God's Christ? Hopefully we've seen this morning that Jesus makes very, very, very big claims about himself, doesn't he? And that deciding to make him your king and to follow him is a big decision. It's not to be taken lightly. But can I urge you to keep looking at Jesus this summer? Keep examining the Bible. Read through Luke's gospel. Look deeply into what the folk heard and saw that brought the disciples to the point where Peter could see that Jesus could be no one other than the Christ of God. Have you recognized the Christ properly? Have you heeded his call to follow him? And secondly, are you following the Christ wholeheartedly? Which of those four temptations that Jesus went through can hold us back? Which do we struggle with most? Is there one of them that's holding us back from wholeheartedly following Jesus? A desire for recognition, for future, for a place and a name in this world, for reputation and for friendship? Can we see this morning the weight of the call to follow him? Have you taken recently time recently to examine each area of your life, to see how it's going? Because Jesus speaks the truth, doesn't he? Following him now is hard. It's easier to ignore Jesus. It's easier to run away from him. But Jesus endured the hardship of the cross because he knew that the future was coming. He knew that the day was coming when he would sit on the throne, when everyone in heaven and earth would see him 
for who he truly is. A world where those who are not ashamed of him will rejoice in glory with him. And that's something that has marked Christians through the centuries who, having fixed their eyes on Jesus, chose to live their life through the ups and the downs, through the hardships of life, through immense suffering, with a real and profound joy. Have we fixed our eyes on the kingdom to come? The kingdom that has come in Jesus' death and ascension to God's side. As we close, C.T. Studd wrote a beautiful poem about his decision to follow Christ. If you've got time later, I'd encourage you to look it up and read it in full. But here's a selection. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Soon would its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life. Twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. The still, small voice gently pleads for a better choice bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Father God, Thank you so much for sending Jesus, your Christ, your Son, to bring about your kingdom. Thank you that he calls us to follow him, to give up our lives for this world, for the certain hope of eternity with you, Father. Thank you for that future. Father God, please, please forgive us when we fail to live up to Jesus' call. Forgive us when we're ashamed of you and your words in our world. Father, help us to live boldly. Help us to follow in Jesus' footsteps, proclaiming his kingdom for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to finish our time together this morning by singing, by declaring together Jesus' kingship, that if we know Jesus, then we have a higher calling, a call that will consume our whole lives in the hope that others will hear us and will join with us in bringing glory to Jesus. Let's stand and sing together.